Section 6 of The Gleam in the North by D. K. Broster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Eileen. Chapter 6 Who is this man? 1. When the officer in charge of the party of redcoats, having set his men close round the house of Ardroy, went in person to demand admittance, it was no servant out of whom he might have surprised information, who answered his peremptory knocking, but, doubtless to his annoyance, and the Chatelaine herself. Captain Jackson, however, saluted civilly enough. Oh, Mrs. Cameron, I think. For, being English, he saw no reason to give these ridiculous courtesy titles to the wives of petty landowners. Yes, sir, responded Allison with dignity. I am Mrs. Cameron. I saw you from above, and, since I've no notion why you have come, I descended in order to find out. If I may enter, madam, I will tell you why I've come, responded the officer promptly. And by all means, enter, said Allison, with even more of stateliness, hoping he would not notice that she was still out of breath with haste, and, waiting while he gave an order or two, preceded him into the parlour. Captain Jackson then became aware that a small boy had somehow slipped to her side. He took a careful look round the large room, and meanwhile Allison, studying his thin, sallow face, decided that she had never seen this officer before, and hoped, for the success of the plan, that neither had he ever seen Ewan. Behind him, through the open parlour door, she perceived her hall full of scarlet coats and white cross-belts and breeches. I'm here, madam, now said the invader, fixing her with a meaning glance. As I think you can very well guess, in the king's name, with a warrant to search this house, in which there is every reason to believe that the owner is sheltering a rebel. Oh, Mr. Cameron is away, sir, responded Allison. How, therefore, can he be sheltering any one? Away? exclaimed Captain Jackson suspiciously. How is that? for he was certainly at home on Thursday. Oh, the day of Dr. Kincaid's visit, thought Allison, and then he did give the alarm. Mr. Cameron was here on Thursday, repeated Captain Jackson with emphasis. Oh, I did not deny it, said Allison, beginning to be nettled at his tone. Nevertheless, he went away yesterday. Whither? was the next question rapped out at her. Whither? And for what purpose? Allison's own highland temper began to rise now, and with a warming uprush came almost a belief in her own statement. Does the king really demand to know that, sir? He went to Inverness on affairs. By this time, Captain Jackson had no doubt realized that he had to do with a lady of spirit. Perhaps then, madam, he suggested, Mr. Cameron deputed the task of hiding the rebel to you. Oh, I think you would do it well. I must search the house thoroughly. Are any of the rooms locked? Yes, one, said Lady Ardroy. I will come with you, and unlock it, if you wish to see in. No, you will stay where you are, madam, if you please, retorted the soldier. I will trouble you for your keys, all your keys. I do not wish to damage any of your property by breaking it open. Biting her lip, Alison went in silence to her writing desk. Captain Jackson took the bunch without more ado, and a moment later Allison and her eldest son were alone, locked in. And when she heard the key turned on her, the colour came flooding into her face, and she stood very erect, tapping with one foot upon the floor, in no peaceable mood. A mother, said Donald, tugging at her skirt. And the red coat does not lock this door. For Captain Jackson had either overlooked or chosen to disregard that in the far corner of the room which led into the kitchen domain. Alison hesitated for a moment. No, better to stay here quietly, as if she had no cause for anxiety. And better not as yet to attempt to send another messenger to Slochnan Ian, who, by blundering, might draw on Dr. Cameron just the danger to be averted. So, for twenty minutes or more, she waited with Donald in the living room, wondering, calculating, 
praying for patience, sometimes going to the windows and looking out, hearing now and then heavy footsteps about the house, and all the sounds of a search, which she knew would be fruitless, and picturing the havoc which the invaders were doubtless making of her household arrangements. Or perhaps, in spite of Morag's presence, they were frightening little Keith, a thought which nearly broke her resolution of staying where she was. Yet, as the minutes ticked away with a slowly fading daylight outside, and nothing happened, her spirits began to rise. Ewan had evidently not been stopped. Indeed, if he once got safely beyond the policies, it was unlikely that he would be. He had probably reached Slochnan Ian unmolested. And surely, too, he would remain there until the soldiers had gone altogether. And, feeling at last some security on that score, Alison sat down and took up a piece of sewing. Oh, but she had not even threaded her needle before there was a stir and a trampling outside the house, and she jumped up and ran to the window. Oh, more soldiers, and someone in the midst of them, tightly held. Her husband. And in that moment Alison knew, and was ashamed of the knowledge, and that she must at the bottom of her heart have been hoping that if anyone were captured... No, no, she had not hoped that. For Dr. Cameron's life was in jeopardy, while nothing could happen to Ewan, save unpleasantness. In expiation of that half-wish, she braced herself to the dissimulation which Ewan had enjoined. She drew the boy beside her away from the window. Oh, the soldiers have caught your father, Donald, after all. Remember that you are to pretend not to know who he is, nor what he is doing here. The little boy nodded with bright eyes and held her hand rather tightly. Will they do anything to me, mother, for saying what is not true? Oh, no, darling, not this time. And if they take father away to Fort William, it is only what he hopes they will do, and he will soon come back to us. By this time the door of the parlour was being unlocked, and in another moment Captain Jackson was striding into the room. Bring him in, he commanded, half turning, and the redcoats brought in a rather hot, dishevelled Ardroy, with a smear of blood down his chin, and with four soldiers, no less, holding him firmly by wrists and arms and shoulders. It was not difficult for Alison to show the agitation demanded. Indeed, there was for an instant the risk that it might exceed its legitimate bounds. But she had herself in hand again at once. Her husband gave her one glance, and shook his head almost imperceptibly, and to show that he had not succeeded in his attempt. Then he looked away again, and studied the antlers over the hearth, while the sergeant in charge of him made his report, the gist of which was that the prisoner, coming unexpectedly upon them near the lake up there, had led them the devil of a chase. Indeed, had he not tripped and fallen, he might have escaped them altogether. How tripped! thought Alison scornfully, as if Ewan, with his perfect balance and his stag's fleetness, ever tripped when he was running. He had thrown himself down for them to take the fools. And that this really was the case, she knew from the passing twitch of amusement at the corner of her husband's blood-stained mouth. But seeing him standing there in the power of the Sajerant Jirak, oh, she wished he had not done it. "'Well, have you anything to say, Mr. Sinclair?' demanded Captain Jackson, planting himself in front of the prize. And at the mention of that name, both Ewan and his wife knew for certain that they owed this visitation to Dr. Kincaid. Or "'Not to you, sir, but I should wish to offer my apologies to Lady Ardroy,' said Ewan, with an inclination of the head in Alison's direction, for bringing about an, an annoying incident in her house.' Captain Jackson shrugged his shoulder. How very polite of you, gad. But, in that case, why have come here in the first instance? He moved away a little, got out a paper, and studied it. And then he looked up, frowning. Who are you? he demanded. How does not your paper tell you that? asked Ewan pleasantly. Alison wondered if the officer thought that he was Loch but Loch Dorney was, she believed, 
a man between fifty and sixty, and Dr. Cameron in the forties. Oh, surely, this officer could not take you in for either. Her heart began to lift a little. Captain Jackson, after looking, still with a frown, from Ewan to the paper, and from the paper to Ewan, suddenly folded it up and glared at her. Oh, madam, who is this man? If I've sheltered him, as you state, is it likely that I should tell you? asked Alison quietly. How call the servants, said Captain Jackson to a soldier near the door. No, wait a moment. He turned again and pointed at Donald, standing at his mother's side, his eyes fixed on the captive, who, for his part, was now looking out of the window. Are you, boy, do you know who this man is? Must you drag in a small child? began Alison indignantly. Oh, if you will not answer, yes, retorted the Englishman. It is quite of an age to supplement your unwillingness, madam. Oh, come, boy, he advanced a little on Donald. Oh, don't be frightened. I'm not going to hurt you. Just tell me now, have you ever seen this man before? And the question appeared to Donald extremely amusing, and, since he was not at all frightened, but merely excited, he gave a little laugh. Oh, yes, sir. How often? His mother's hand on his shoulder gave him a warning pressure. I I could not count. Oh, six times. Oh, seven times? More? He comes here often, then. And Donald considered. One could not say that father came here. He was here. No, sir. Oh, he does not come often, eh? How long has he been there this time? Donald, a little perplexed, glanced up at his mother. What was he to say to this? But Captain Jackson now took steps to prevent his receiving any more assistance from that source. He stretched out a hand. Oh, no, thank you, Mrs. Cameron. If you won't speak, you shan't prompt, either. Oh, come here, boy. He drew Donald, without roughness, away, and placed him more in the middle of the room, with his back to his mother. Have you ever heard this gentleman called Sinclair? he asked. Now, tell the truth. Donald told it. No, never, he replied, shaking his golden head. <laughs> I thought as much. Well now, my boy, I'll make a guess at what you have heard him called, and you shall tell me if I guess right, eh? And Captain Jackson, attempting heartiness, smiled somewhat sourly. Oh, I'll not promise, said the child cautiously. How oh, the young devil has been primed, said the soldier under his breath. Then he shot the query at him as suddenly as possible. His name is the same as yours, and Cameron. Taken aback by this, Donald wrinkled his brows and said nothing. With doctor in front of it, Dr. Cameron, pursued the inquisitor. Now, have I not guessed right? Oh, no, sir, said Donald, relieved. Ewan was no longer looking out of the window, and he was frowning more than Captain Jackson had frowned. He had never foreseen Donald's being harried with questions. How do you imagine, he broke in, suddenly, and that a man in my shoes is like to have his real name flung about in the hearing of a small child? Captain Jackson paid no heed to this remark. Now, my boy, you can remember the name quite well, if you choose. Of that I'm sure. If you don't choose... He paused suggestively. And take your hand off that child's shoulder, commanded Ardroy in a voice so dangerous that, though he had not moved, his guards instinctively took a fresh grip of him. Oh, ho, said Captain Jackson, transferring his attention at once from the little boy. Who is that where the wind blows from? Oh, this young mule is a relative of yours. How oh, is that the only reason a man may have for objecting to see a small child bullied? asked Ewan hotly. Oh, tis not the only one in Scotland, I assure you, whatever you English may feel about the matter. But Captain Jackson declined to follow this red herring. What lies entirely with you, Mr. Sinclair, to prevent any further questioning? No, it does not, declared Ewan. I've told you once, sir, that a man in my position does not have his real name cried to all the winds of heaven. Lady Ardroy herself is ignorant of it. She took me in, knowing only that I was in need of rest and shelter. 
I do not wish her to learn it, lest Mr. Cameron, when he returns, be not best pleased to find whom she has been housing in his absence. But I will tell you my name at Fort William, if, indeed, your commanding officer there do not find it out first. This excursion into romance, a quite sudden inspiration on its author's part, really shook Captain Jackson for a moment, since he was well aware that there were divisions, and sharp ones, among the Jacobites. Yet from Dr. Kincaid's account, you and Cameron himself, two days ago, had answered from Mr. Sinclair. As he stood undecided, enlightenment came to him from a most unexpected quarter. Father, suddenly said a high, clear little voice, Father, has you finded them? What's this? The English officer swung round. Indeed, every man in the room turned to look at the small figure, which, quite unobserved, even by Allison, had strayed in through the open door. And before anyone had tried to stop him, Keith had pattered forward and seized his father round the legs. Might come down to look for my dears, he announced, smiling up at him. Who is all these peoples? It was the last query about identity asked that evening. Ewan saw that the game was up, and the soldiers who held him having, perhaps unconsciously, loosed their hold at this gentle and unexpected arrival. He stooped and caught up the wrecker of his gallant scheme. No, my wee bird, I've not found your dears. I've been found myself, he whispered, and could not keep a smile from the lips which touched that velvet cheek. But the implications of this unlooked-for greeting had now burst upon Captain Jackson with shattering force. Half inarticulate with rage, he strode forward and shook his fist in the prisoner's face. You, you liar! You are yourself, you and Cameron. Oh, pray do not terrify this child, also, observed the culprit coolly. For Keithy, after one look at the angry soldier, had hidden his face on his father's shoulder. He's only three years old, and not worthy of your attentions. Captain Jackson fairly gibbered. Oh, you think that you have fooled me, you and your lady there. You'll soon find out at Fort William who is the fool. And put that child down. Oh, please make that red gentleman go away, petitioned a small voice from the neighborhood of Ardroy's neck. Oh, that's out of my power, I fear, my darling, replied the young man and you had better go to mother now. Since, with a child in his arms, not a soldier seemed disposed to hinder him, he walked calmly across the room and put Keithy into Alison's, whence he contemplated Captain Jackson with a severe and heavenly gaze. Well, now that this charming domestic interlude is over, snapped that soldier, perhaps, sir, you will vouchsafe some explanation of your conduct in leading my men this dance, and is striving to hide your identity in your own house in this ridiculous fashion. When Mr. Cameron returns, forsooth. Again, Ewan, usually a punctiliously truthful person, was inspired to a flight of imagination. I admit that it was foolish of me, he replied with every appearance of candor. But I saw you and your men coming, and having been out, as you probably know, in the forty-five, I thought it better to instruct my wife to say that I was from home, and left the house by a back window. I see now that I should have done better to show more courage, and to stay and face your visit out." During this explanation Captain Jackson, his hands behind his back, was regarding the self-styled coward very fixedly. And do you think that you can gull me into believing that you led my men that chase because of anything you did six or seven years ago, Mr. Ewan Cameron? No, you were playing the decoy, and giving the man you're hiding here a chance to get away. Ardroy shrugged his shoulders. Well, have it your own way, sir, he said indifferently. I know that a simple explanation of a natural action is seldom believed. No, only by simpletons, retorted Captain Jackson. However, you can try its effect upon Lieutenant Governor Layton at Fort William, for to Fort William you will go, Mr. Cameron, without delay. And do not imagine that I shall accompany you. I have not finished looking for your friend from Caithness, and when you are no longer here to draw the pursuit, it may be that I shall find him. 
It was true that Ewan had contemplated being taken to Fort William, but not exactly in his own character and upon his own account. And this was a much less attractive prospect. However, there was no help for it, and the only thing that mattered was that Archie should get safely away. If only he could be certain that he had. Surely, the McMartins. His thoughts sped up to Slochten and Ian. Now take two file of men, Sergeant, said Captain Jackson, and set out with Mr. Cameron at once. You can reach Highbridge by nightfall and lie there. At that, Alison came forward. She had put down Keithy and was holding him by the hand. He continued to regard the English officer with the same unmitigated disapproval. How oh, do you mean, sir, that you're sending my husband to Fort William at once, and this very evening? Yes, madam, I've really no choice, replied the soldier, who appeared to have regained control of his temper. But if he will give me his word of honor to go peaceably, and make no attempt to escape, by the way, I need not order any harsh measures for the journey. How will you do that, Mr. Cameron? Ewan came back to his own situation, and to a longing to feel Keithy in his arms again for a moment. Yes, sir. I pledge you my word as a gentleman to give no trouble on the road. Indeed, why should I? he added. I'm innocent. But if Mr. Cameron is to go at once, objected Alison, pray allow me time to put together a few necessaries for him, since however short a while he stays at Fort William, he will need them. Instant departure was not so urgent that Captain Jackson could reasonably refuse this request. Yes, you may do that, madam he replied a trifle stiffly, provided that you're not more than a quarter of an hour about the business. Otherwise the party may be benighted before they can reach Highbridge. And he went quite civilly to hold the door for her. As Alison passed her husband, she looked at him hard with a question in her eyes, and she wanted to be sure. Again he gave an almost imperceptible shake of the head. She drew her brows together and with a child on either side of her, and the elder lagging and gazing half frightened, half admiringly, at his captive father, went out of the room. Captain Jackson did the same, but he left four men with muskets behind him. Of these Ewan took no notice, but began walking slowly up and down the room dear to him by so many memories. Now that the moment of being taken from his home was upon him, he did not like it. But he would soon be back, he told himself. How heavily would he be fined by the government for this escapade? However little, it would mean a still harder struggle to make both ends meet. But no price was too high to pay for Archie's life, or for Keithy's. Both of them were tangled up somehow in this payment. He wondered, too, with some uneasiness, how and why the redcoats, whom he had allowed to capture him, had been right up by Loch Nahollere when he came upon them. And they, and that had been a chase, too. He was young enough to have enjoyed it. The door was opened again. There was Alison, with a little packet in her hand, and Captain Jackson behind her. Oh, you can take leave of your wife, Mr. Cameron, said he, motioning him to come to her at the door. But only, it was evident, under his eyes and in his hearing. So nothing could be said about Archie. Even Gallic was not safe, for it was quite possible that the Englishman had picked up a few words. Under the officer's eyes, then, Ardroy took his wife in his arms and kissed her. I shall not be away for long, my dear. God bless you. And kiss the boys for me. To Alison Cameron, it seemed incredible that he was really being taken from her with so little warning, when only a couple of hours ago he had been in her room asking about Keithy's lost toys. And, for all either of them yet knew, he might be sacrificing himself in vain. But she looked up into his eyes and said, with meaning, I will try to do all you wish while you are away a wifely utterance to which Captain Jackson could hardly take exception. And three minutes later, with no more intimate leave-taking than that, 
She was at the window watching her husband being marched away under the beaches of the avenue with his little guard. Before he vanished from sight, he turned and waved his hand, with the air of one who meant to be back ere any of their leaves had fluttered down. Oh, "'I am sorry for this, madam,' said the voice of Captain Jackson behind her. "'But, if you'll forgive me for saying so, Mr. Cameron has brought it upon himself. Now, understand, if you please, that no one is to leave the house on any pretext. I've not finished here, yet. But you are free to go about your ordinary occupations, and I'll see that you're not molested, so long as my order is observed. For that, Alison thanked him, and went upstairs to solace her loneliness by putting little Keith to bed. She had already tried to send Morag, the easiest to come at of the servants, up the brae, and had not found it feasible. And, surely, surely, Dr. Cameron must have taken the alarm by now, and be away. Still, there was always her promise to Ewan, a promise which it began to seem impossible to carry out. 2. Yet, in a sense, that promise was already in process of being kept, though in a manner of which Alison was fortunately ignorant. At the very moment when she had finally succeeded in satisfying her younger son's critical inquiries about the gentleman downstairs that was so angry her eldest-born, whom she had last seen seated on the stairs, gazing down through the rails with deep interest at the group of soldiers in the hall, was halfway between the house and Loch Nahollen, his heart beating rapidly with excitement, triumph, and another less agreeable emotion. Both in courage and intelligence, Donald was old for his years. He knew that his mother had tried in vain to send Morag out of the house while she was making up the packet for father. The resplendent idea had then come to him of himself carrying out father's wish and warning Dr. Cameron of the presence of the soldiers, of which he partially at least grasped the importance. On the whole, he thought he would not tell his mother until the deed was accomplished, for it was just possible that if he mentioned his purpose beforehand she would forbid him to carry it through. As for getting out of the house, perhaps the soldiers at the various doors would not pay much attention to him, whom they probably considered just a little boy, though it was scarcely so that he thought of himself. Perhaps, also, they would not be aware that never in his life before had he been out so late alone. He could say that he had lost a ball in the shrubbery, and that would be true, for he had, about a month ago, and, even if it had not been true, lies seemed to be strangely permissible today. He could creep out of the shrubbery on the other side, and then run, run all the way round the end of the loch, and up the track which climbed the shoulder of Miaur Achai. As it happened, Donald did not have to employ the plea about the lost ball, for in wandering round the back premises he came on a door which was not guarded at all. Its particular sentry was even then escorting his father towards Fort William, and by some oversight had not been replaced. So the small adventurer quite easily found himself among the outbuildings, deserted and silent, except for the voices of two invisible redcoats who were arguing about something round the corner of the stables. By them his light footfall went unheard, and a moment or two afterwards Donald was looking back in elation from the edge of the policies on the lighted window of the house of Ardroy. That was a good ten minutes ago. Now, he was wishing that he had brought Lueth with him. Oh, it was such a strange darkness, not really dark, but an eerie kind of half-light. And the loch, which he was now approaching. And what an odd ghostly shine the water had between the trees, he had never seen it look like that before. And this was, past all doubt, and the hour of that dread thing, the water horse. And Donald's feet began to falter a little in the path as he came nearer and nearer to the loch of the eagle, so friendly in the day, and so very different now. No child in the highlands but had heard many a story of water horse and kelpie and urisk however much his elders might discourage such narratives. 
It was true that father had told him, and there were no such things as these fabled inhabitants of loch and stream and mountainside. But the awful fact remained that Morag had a second cousin in Kintail, who had been carried off by an Ech Uske. En loch duch it was, seeing a beautiful horse come into his little enclosure. He could not resist climbing on to its back. That was just what the water-horse wanted, for it rushed down to the loch with its rider, and Morag's second cousin was never seen again. Only next day his lungs floated ashore. All the rest of him had been eaten up. Not quite to know what one's lungs were made it still more horrible. At Donald's age, one is not capable of formulating an axiom about the difficulty of proving a negative. But this evening's adventure brought the boy some instinctive perception of its truth. Her father had never seen a water horse, it was true. But in the face of Morag's story. And then there was another most disturbing thought to accompany him. And what if something in the nature of an angel were suddenly to appear? and throw him into the loch as a punishment and for having pushed Keithy in and made him ill. And there would be no father on the island now to rescue him. Donald's steps grew slower still. He was now almost skirting Loch Nahollere on the little track through the heather and bracken, where the pine branches swayed and whispered, and made the whole atmosphere, too, much darker and more alarming. If he had realized earlier the possibility of an avenger. And then he thought of those who had fought at the great battle before he was born, of cousin Ian Stewart and the broken claymore, of his father, of the dead chief whose name he bore, and went onwards with a brave and beating heart. But there were such strange sounds all round him, noises and cracklings which he had never heard in the day open-air little boy though he was, and once he jumped violently as something shadowy and slim ran across his very path. Oh, only a weasel, said the child to himself, but a very large one. And then Donald's heart gave a bound and seemed to stop altogether. Something much bigger than a weasel was coming, and though he could not see it, it was trampling through the undergrowth on his right. And the Ech Uske, undoubtedly, there broke from him a little sound too attenuated for a shriek, a small puppy-like whimper of dismay. "'Who's there?' called out a man's voice sharply. "'Who's there? Answer me.' "'Oh, at least, then, it was not a water-horse. "'I'm... I'm Donald Cameron of Ardroy replied the adventurer in quavering tones, his eyes fixed on the dark, dim shape now visible, from the waist upwards, among the surging waves of bracken. This did not look like an avenging angel, either. It seemed to be just a man. "'Oh, Donald!' it exclaimed. "'Oh, what in the name of the good being are you doing here at this hour? Oh, don't be frightened, child, and tis your Uncle Hector.' and the apparition pushed through the fern and bent over him. Why are you lost, my boy? Immensely relieved, Donald looked up at the young man. He had not seen him for nearly two years, and his actual recollections of his appearance were hazy, but he had often heard of the uncle, who was a soldier of the King of France. Evidently, too, Uncle Hector had lately been in some battle, for he wore round his head a bandage, which showed white in the dusk. No, Uncle Hector, I'm not lost. I'm going up to Sloch Nan Ian to tell Dr. Cameron that there are some soldiers come after him and that he must go away quickly. Oh, Dr. Cameron, exclaimed his uncle in surprise. Then, glancing round, he lowered his voice and dropped on one knee beside the little boy. Oh, what on earth is he doing at Ardroy? Oh, I thought he never came here now. You're sure that it was Dr. Cameron and Donald? and not Mr. Macfair of Loch Thorny. No, I know it was Dr. Cameron. He stayed in our house first. He came because... because Keithy was ill. His head went down for a second. He made him well again. And the other doctor, from Maryborough,
came to. Then Dr. Cameron went up to stay with Angus McMartin. And if you please, I must go on to Slochten and Ian at once. But his young uncle, though he had risen to his feet again, was still blocking the path and staring down at him, and saying as though he was speaking to himself. Oh, then it was he who's just gone away from Slochten and Ian with Angus, only they were so discreet, and they'd not name him to me. No, my little hero, and there's no need for you to go any farther. I've just come from Angus's cottage myself, and they told me the gentleman was gone some time since, because of the soldiers down at the house. And, by the way, are the soldiers still there? Yes, and some of them have taken father away to Fort William. They ran after him. He got out of a window, and they caught him and thought at first he was Dr. Cameron. Father wanted them to think that, explained Donald, with a sort of vicarious pride. Hector Grant's brow grew black under the bandage. Oh, mon Dieu! Mon Dieu, quel malheur! Oh, I must see your mother, Donald. Now go back, Luchin, and try to get her to come up to me here by the loch. I'll take you a part of the way. You're sure, Uncle Hector, asked Donald anxiously, that Dr. Cameron has gone away. A good child, said Uncle Hector appreciatively. Yes, a foi de gentilhomme, Donald, he is gone. There's no need for you to continue this nocturnal adventure. And I fancy that your mother will forgive me a good deal for putting a stop to it. Oh, come along. Most willingly did Donald's hand slide into that of his uncle. If one can be quit of a rather terrifying enterprise with honor. It did not seem nearly so dark now, and the water horse had gone back into the land of bedtime stories. But there was still an obstacle to his protector's plan, of which he must inform him. Oh, I don't think, Uncle Hector, he said, doubtfully, as they began to move away, that the soldiers will let Mother come out to see you. Nobody was to leave the house, they said. Oh, they did not see me come out. But perhaps they would let you go in. Uncle Hector stopped. Oh, they let me in, fast enough, I warrant. But would they let me come out again? Perhaps, after all, I'd better come no nearer. Can you go back from here alone, Donald? But indeed I see you can, since you have such a stout heart. The heart in question fell a little at this flattering deduction. By the way, you say Keithy is better. Is he quite recovered? Oh, Keithy? He's out of bed today. Indeed, said Keithy Senior quite scornfully, and tis a pity he is, for he came downstairs by his lane when the soldiers were here and did a very silly thing and he explained in what Keithy's foolishness had consisted. So it was he that spoiled father's fine plan, which I knew all about. Ah, fine plan! I wonder what your mother thought of it, once more commented Hector Grant, half to himself. Well, Donald, give her this kiss from me, and tell her that I will contrive somehow to see her when the soldiers have gone. Meanwhile, I think I'll return to the safer hospitality of Miao Lachal. Now, run home. She'll be anxious about you. He stooped and kissed the self-appointed messenger, and gave him an encouraging pat. Oh, good night, Uncle Hector, said Donald politely. I'll tell Mother. And he set off at a trot, which soon carried him out of sight in the dusk. And now, what am I going to do? asked Lieutenant Hector Grant in French of his surroundings. Something croaked in the rushes of Loch Ah, oh, Tidi, he inquired, turning his head. Nay, jesting apart, this is a pretty coil that I've set on foot. End of section 6